participants so we can start so let's see how other people will join in the course of time <clears throat> So, uh, shall we start now then? Hello? Uh, Professor Madhurima, uh, shall we start or? Uh, yes. Or uh, we just wait for the YouTube. The YouTube is on. The link okay. is live. We can start. So, so we can start now. <clears throat> so uh, welcome to the uh, IAP, IOP, Cockcroft Welton webinar 2022. So today is the second day. So just few words for uh, mainly for the IPA, the, those who are joined uh, for the two days program only. So Indian Physics Association was founded in 1970 and has more than 4,000 uh, members spread all over India. The main aim of IPA to help the achievement and dissemination and the application of the knowledge of physics and the promote the active interaction among the community. The Indian Physics Association has been an active platform for the physics community in India for the past 50 years and has facilitated uh, interaction through many different channels. IPA also worked to promote the gender equality in the physics profession. It also liaises with the physics society of other nations. This program is a, the present program is a joint venture with the Institute of Physics UK and the Ireland. The Institute of Physics is a professional body and the Learned Society for Physics in the UK and the Ireland. It's inspired the people to develop their knowledge, understanding and the enjoyment of physics and is also a world leading science publishers. This webinar is a part of a bilateral exchange lecture series between the Institute of Physics and Indian Physics Association, which was started in 1998. The eminent physicists from the UK and Ireland and India are chosen to deliver lecture on topics of mutual interest and that the focus on the global challenge where the physics play an integral role. So when this organized by the IPA, the lecture at lectures are called the Cockcroft Welton lectures, uh, while those organized by the Institute of Physics UK, they are called the Homi Bhava lectures. In India, this lecture series is supported through a grant, grant by the Department of Atomic Energy and Tata Trust. Now coming back to the today's event. So it's my pleasure to have all the esteemed panelists and interested participants for panel discussion on COVID-19 lesson for the future. And the professor, uh, the renowned professor uh, Katharina Kauri will conduct this today's panel discussion. You already heard yesterday uh, her lecture. This is a fantastic lecture where she has uh, delivered yesterday. She is a senior lecturer in applied mathematics at the Cardiff University UK. She's hold a DPhil from Oxford University and a BA in mathematics from the Cambridge University. His research, uh, in her research, Katharina, Professor Katharina tackles cutting edge interdisciplinary challenges in physics, biology, engineering, business, and society. During the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Professor Katharina has been worked intensively on the model of COVID-19 transmission that is in collaboration with University of Oxford. And she's also the uh, advising the world's government. She has owned the several research grants, including a tackling COVID-19 grant from the world's government. She is passionate about the science communication and the, pub and the public engagement. And she has been a TEDx speaker and TED edu edu uh, educator. She is currently the director of impact and <clears throat> engagement at Cardiff Mathematics. She has coordinated two European study group with the industry workshop where the terms of researchers solve real life challenges using modeling and data analysis. She is particularly interested in how science and the policymaking can come together efficiently. She has also been the vice president of parallel uh, parliament for the research, innovation, and digital governance in her home country, Cyprus. In 2021, she was nominated, nominated as Woman of Year in Innovation at Cyprus. To conduct the panel discussion, now I would like to invite Professor Katharina Kauri to start it. Thanks. Please, uh, Professor, Ka Professor Kauri. I just hand over the mic to the Professor Kauri. Sorry, muted. So thank you, Professor Mandal, for the nice introduction. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here today. Um, and welcome everybody uh, joining us from India and the UK and uh, any other countries. It is a great pleasure to have all of you here with us. So the Cockroft Wharton Lecture Series, uh, as uh, you said, Professor, is a bilateral exchange of lectures between the IOP and the IPA. Uh, the lecture series have been running successfully since 1998. And here we are today in a panel discussion that focuses on one of the largest challenges of our time, the COVID-19 pandemic. So the SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic has claimed more than 6 million lives by now. And scientists worldwide, physicists, engineers, modelers, biologists, medical doctors, and other disciplines have been working around the clock to fight the pandemic in collaboration with governments. So the World Health Organization has warned that the pandemic is not over. We are still learning and there is still a level of uncertainty, especially due to the several variants of the virus that have emerged and new waves appearing in, in several countries. Moreover, new viruses are emerging every day, threatening our lives when we barely had time to start recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is why the Institute of Physics and the Indian Physics Association have convened this panel of four world-leading experts on the COVID-19 pandemic to discuss the lessons we have learned so far from the pandemic and how these lessons could help us move forward towards a better future. It is with great pleasure that I welcome our interdisciplinary panel of world-leading experts. In alphabetical order, sorry, uh, we first have Professor uh, Saptar Shimbasu from the Indian uh, Institute of Science, then Professor Gangandeep Gang from the Wellcome Trust Research Laboratory in India, Professor Gaudam Menon from Ashoka University in India, and Professor Catherine Knox from the University of Leeds in the UK. They are here today to present and discuss their work on the COVID-19 pandemic. The discussion will be chaired uh, by me, and you have heard the introduction uh, about me from Professor um, Mandal. So let's go to our four panelists now. Each panelist will give a short introduction to their research and work for a few minutes, and then we are going to have a hopefully lively question and answer session. You can write your questions in the question box. You can see that in the um, Zoom and down Q&A. So that's where you find the question box and you can do that question, uh, put your questions there at any time. The question and answer session will start after all four panelists have finished their introduction. 
And if your question is specifically addressed to one of the panelists, please mention this in your question. You could also write which organization you are from, but that is entirely optional. So um, I'm going to be introducing each of our panelists in alphabetical order. So I will first start with uh, Professor Saptarshi um, Basu before he gives his introduction. So Professor Basu is currently the Pratt and Whitney Chair Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Science. He's, he primarily works on multi-phase systems, especially in droplets across multiple application domains. He's a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering, ASME, the Institute of Physics, the Royal Aeronautical Society, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. Professor Basu is also the recipient of the DST Swarnajayanti Fellowship in Engineering. So Professor Basu, over to you. Uh, to uh, give us your introduction. Thank you, Professor Katarina. Uh, can I share my screen now? Uh, I guess uh, you have to stop sharing yours before I can share mine. Yeah. My screen is visible. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so thanks for this opportunity and for the invitation. So, uh, I will just basically talk about a couple of things in very brief details. Uh, first is our uh, our kind of a unique work on the role of face masks during the pandemic, because as we know that the face mask has been pivotal in the prevention of the disease. And then I will talk about something a little bit more interesting, which is about a first principle based pandemic model, which has been done in association with a few of my colleagues uh, across, the, across the globe. So the collaborators and the students' names are there at the, at the bottom. Uh, so, so the role of face masks during the COVID-19 pandemic, let me show you three videos, which will be self-explanatory. The first one is a single layer mask. The second one is a double layer mask. The last one is a triple layer mask, if you look at the videos over there. So if you look at it, uh, normally people study the droplet. Uh, when you wear the mask, you basically try to consider the filtration efficiency of the droplets and how much air actually goes through around it, whether the mask is on tightly or not. Here we show something which is a little bit more interesting than that. We show that it, as you uh, during a coughing or a sneezing event, these bigger size droplets as they impinge on the mask, they can actually undergo an extrusion process and give rise to this aerosols. So if you look at the graph on the, on, the, on the bottom right, you will find that though we started with a very large size droplet, which normally after coming out of your mouth would settle on the ground in the vicinity, that actually aerosolizes and gives rise to many droplets in the less than 100 micron range. So moment that happens, these droplets will now form the nuclei or will aerosolize and then they can be carried over longer distances and they can hover in the environment for a significantly larger amount of time. So this, is, this happens when you actually have improper mask, mask made of cloths or something like that, which is single layer basically. So uh, and this surprisingly is, is independent of the droplet size. So whatever droplet comes out during your coughing event, they will all undergo this extrusion process and give rise to a distribution like this. So also we, we showed that if you actually wear a wet mask, that can happen if you're wearing a mask for too long. So throughout the day, you're wearing the same type of mask. Now that mask may be actually a hydrophobic mask, or a hydrophilic type of mask, hydrophobic meaning the droplets will form these BD structures on the top of the mask, or hydrophilic means they will actually get absorbed and moist the mask surface. In both cases, you see actually reduced penetration. That means whatever is coming out of your mouth, they won't extrude that easily through the mask fibers. Having done the single droplet study, we actually showed it in the case of mannequins, what happens. So what you can see over here, this is a no mask event. And you can see this is the cough. And you can see it looks, looks alarming, but that is what exactly happens when this cough droplets comes out of your mouth. So you can see this plethora of droplets coming out. 
when you actually wear a mask of a certain level of porosity, this is a management's face is covered with a mask now, you find there is a lot more misty particles that comes out. And when you actually go for a slightly, even a mask which is a little bit dense in its pore size, you see some of these, even the mist structure actually slightly decreases, okay? And, but still there is a lot of droplet that actually comes out. So if you measure what is the droplet sizes before it hits the mask and after it hits the mask, you will find that there is a lot of droplets which falls into the aerosol region, which is less than 100 microns. And if you look at it closely through this innovative high-speed imaging, you will find that even the smaller droplets will show the same type of effects. So actually when you cough and you cough hard and if you wear improper masking, this is a secondary role, route of infection that can actually happen because of this generation of these aerosols, which was not there to begin with. We try to do the same thing that if you now seed these uh, droplets with these fluorescent markers, basically to mimic the virus, you will find that indeed there is a lot of uh, virus or virions that are actually uh, attached to the mass surface, but many of them actually come out I mean, this particular stage from the outs outside of the mask, and you get a lot of these particles of almost to the uh, 10 to the power of nine particles per milliliter that actually comes out uh, on the other side. So you can understand, so not only the droplets comes out, it carries with it a significant amount of viral loads as it goes into the atmosphere, this aerosol floats around and can cause havoc. So the conclusions essentially what we, uh, what we offered from this particular study is basically you have to use, obviously we know by now that you have to use this triple layer proper masking because in India, especially in the Indian context, in the rural areas, there are a lot of people who use this, you know, bandanas, they are used as cloths, handkerchiefs, whatever you can get hold of to cover your faces. But unfortunately, in all such cases, you actually risk the propensity of generating aerosols from the bigger droplets, which are not supposed to you know, cause any damage at all, because bigger droplets are supposed to fall on the ground and not travel further more than a certain amount of distance. So, so this was one of the, some of the conclusions that you drew that this secondary route of infection can be only stopped if you wear your masks properly. And if you wear the three layer masks, then this will actually get reduced by quite a bit. But as you can see for a single layer mask, the penetrated volume of the, of the calf, during the calf event, whatever droplets that you release, about 70% of its volume actually comes out to the other side. So it's only 30% blockage that you will have. So that was kind of a little scary from that perspective. But at the same time, this also emphasizes why you should use a three layer mask as well. So, and so that was, the, that was one aspect. And just to give you a quick update on what we did on the pandemic side of things. So this was the masking side, the pandemic side of things. Just to give a very brief idea that uh, normally I come from a fluid mechanics background and uh, from a droplet background actually. So uh, as we all know by now that, okay, you cough, there is a droplet cloud that is created. This cloud expands and a uh, healthy individual inhales uh, the, the infected air volume basically with the droplets inside it, and then he gets, he or she gets infected in the process. So what we actually wanted to do, there are a lot of pandemic models that people have tried. What we wanted to see over here is that, can we see the droplet level physics? That means how these droplets move with the airflow. Okay. That means this, this, kind of a, this kind of a flow profile is generated when you actually cough or sneeze. Then we look at the aerodynamics of the droplet, that how they disperse and how they disperse and how the droplet cloud actually grows. And then we look at the heat and mass transfer aspect of the droplets. That means how these droplets actually vaporize from here to here to the crystallization stage. And once we form the crystals, how the virions are actually embedded inside those precipitates. And this was exactly the four step models that we followed uh, for the droplets and try to incorporate it into an ACIR type of model. So that was the idea because this would be a first principle approach where we actually have physics for all of these and we try to incorporate it into the main model. So uh, 
normally when you eat, when you actually do this evaporation and all these models for the droplet level, you get a, what we call a modified Wells curve, not going into the details, people would know that, that this predicts which will be the droplet nuclei, what will be the settled droplets, what will remain in the droplet stage. But we also show that depending on the relative humidity and the temperature conditions, for example, if you want to compare Kolkata with say London or with New York, that how these droplets are supposed to evaporate, what will be the typical droplet lifetime under these cities in these conditions. And we can see that the droplet lifetime can be higher by almost an order for high humidity and low temperature. So this is, this is common sense, but actually this puts some numbers that what will be the exact droplet lifetime coming out of the model. And these models are all validated by the experimental data as well. Now, what we do is that we take this model approach. Now we go to an ACIRD type of model in which, which is basically we take, uh, take inspiration from the chemical kinetics type of a framework where a susceptible person uh, interacts with an infected person and you get an exposed person and an infected person. So there are a few rate constants that comes out of it like K1, K2, K3, K4. And K1 can have many sub divisions as well depending on the type of respiratory events. Now in this one, all we need to figure out, we found out that you need to figure out what will be this constant K1. How, that means how an infected person becomes exposed. And we do this when you actually cast it, and there is a little bit of math involved here, that when you cast this in the form of, a, of an equation, you find that all these parameters that are there in this equation comes from the specific droplet model. For example, this comes from the aerodynamics of the model, this comes from the velocity, and this comes out from a generalized probability of infection, which depends on the droplet cloud and how it grows, what is the size of the droplets and stuff like that. Okay, so what we have done is that we fitted this physics based model into the, you know, an SCRD type of model so that we can get a framework in which, which can be now extended and can be made more complicated if you want. And, but it gives a, a framework for doing the, future pandemic model. And uh, this uh, is- Sorry, uh, can I interrupt, uh, uh, Dr. Basu? Actually, your uh, screen, uh, is it possible uh, to make, uh, you know, uh, kind of high? It? Yeah, OK, this is better. Okay, no, no, no. Only a few slides I didn't interrupt you, but yeah. Oh, no, okay. no, no, no problem at all. Thanks, thanks. So this is just, I will just explain one curve, and then I will stop after that. For example, what you see, D is the infection probability from droplets. N is the infection probability due to the nuclei, and T plus N is the total probability. So as you can see that as you go on increasing the time after a respiratory event, the probability of infection from the droplets actually comes down, and the probability of infection from the nuclei goes up, which makes sense. And the total probability, however, falls somewhere in between, which is between the droplet and the nuclei and, uh, and, the, and the droplet modes. And we also show that if you just use a mask, like our previous study showed, and you cut off droplets uh, below a certain size range, which is 10 micron, you can effectively decrease the, the infection peak by at least three times right over there. Okay. So this is just to give a few data and a few highlights that how uh, we have established a new framework and how our mask related studies can actually aid in the understanding of the, you know, the social context of using masks, as well as future pandemic models, where these kind of informations, I mean, information from the first principle may actually make the models more robust and more realistic. And with that, I basically, basically end this introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Basso. This was a very interesting um, research into masks, uh, which uh, have played a very important role increasingly during the pandemic, and uh, they are bound to play a role in our lives in the future. So uh, we're looking forward to discussing more on masks uh, during the discussion. So now I'm going to go um, and introduce uh, Professor Gagadip uh, Tang. 
So, uh, Professor Gang is a virologist and a professor of microbiology at the Wellcome Trust Research Laboratory, Division of Gastrointestinal Sciences at the Christian Medical College in Velour. She has worked on the vaccines for rotaviruses, uh, cholera, and typhoid. Typhoid, sorry. In the past two years, she has initiated a number of collaborative research programs on SARS CoV 2 and SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. She co-authored the best-selling book, Till We Win, Indians Fight Against the COVID-19 Pandemic. She is the first Indian woman scientist to be elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 2019. She has served on the scientific advisory or strategic committee of several national and international institutions, including the Wellcome Trust, UK, the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, the International Vaccine Institute, and the International Centers for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. She is vice chair, vice chair of the Board of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and a Welcome Trust nominated board member of Hilleman Laboratories. She's a member of several advisory committees for the World Health Organization related to research and use of vaccines. So, Professor Gang, over to you. Uh, to give us your introduction. Thank you very much, Katrina. Um, I'd like to follow Dr. Basu's example and talk really about two areas that we've been working on related to SARS-CoV-2. To set the context for the first one is the question of data in India on infections and disease. Now, when the pandemic started, there were a lot of restrictions on who could do testing, where testing could be done. There's still restrictions on who can sequence. But um, at least in terms of testing, it opened up. But there were some things where the data didn't make sense. For example, two of the states that reported among the highest numbers of cases and deaths based on their population actually had really low zero positivity rates when national level zero surveys were done. So these states were castigated as being unable to control the outbreak because they had so many deaths. But if you look at evidence of prior exposure to infection, they actually had really low rates, which goes to, at least to me, to seem that they must have done a pretty good job of controlling infections. So because there was very little data that allowed us to understand what was really going on in the field, I recommended to many others and started myself a study that looked at actual cohorts. It's a bit like the ONS surveys that are being done in the UK to take people, but here a cohort and sample them every week to see who is infected or not, to correlate this with the history of vaccination or prior exposure and see what's happening over time in this population. So we started this cohort of approximately 1,200 individuals about 15 months ago, just post the Delta wave. And we found that by that time itself, about 70% of the population was already seropositive, 30% were not. And only about 15% of the population had been vaccinated at that time. We have continued to follow them and essentially between last June and December, we saw a total of about 16 infections, mostly asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And then something changed in December and we know what that was. And suddenly the pace of infections accelerated to a point where through the month of January, about 20% of the cohort was testing positive every week. We estimate that about 55% of the cohort had at least one infection in January. And then of course the Omicron wave passed and we continued to follow individuals up. Lately with the new variants that have arisen in the last month or so, 
we've started to see a positivity rate of somewhere between one and three percent of the population that we are following. We track these individuals for antibodies, we track them for responses to vaccines, and we are also looking at what hybrid immunity really means in terms of the vaccinated and infected individuals. As with others, it's very clear that infection protects strongly against severe disease and in the case of the Delta wave against symptomatic infections as well. The numbers are too small to be able to continue to look at variant specific severe disease beyond this point, but clearly there is very little protection from infection with uh, the Omicron variants. So that is a cohort study that I anticipate will yield useful results in the time to come. As far as I'm aware, there are actually no such intensive samples of uh, people anywhere else in India. And it would be great to see these studies replicated in other locations. The other study that we really wanted to answer in order to have questions, uh, at least to have policy decided on, was the question of whether you should use homologous or heterologous vaccination for booster doses. In India, about 87% of the population has received essentially the AstraZeneca vaccine and about 13% of the doses that have been given with very high coverage rates in our population is an inactivated vaccine called Covaxin. And based on data that was coming out of particularly South America, it seemed like the inactivated vaccines were not going to be uh, as protected as some of the other vaccine platforms we have seen. So we did what is called a mix and match study with the two vaccines. And what our data seem to indicate is much like the Comcov study in the UK, if you boost a adenovirus vectored vaccine with an adenovirus vectored vaccine, you wind up getting an increase in the level of antibodies, but um, not as much as might be seen with other platforms. Using an inactivated vaccine on top of an adenovirus vectored vaccine is essentially not going to result in an antibody boost. However, if you have an inactivated vaccine for your primary series and you follow that with an adenovirus vectored vaccine, you can see a very large jump in the antibody levels, and it looks like priming with the inactivated vaccine is good, leads to low antibodies, and then if you come in with another platform, that can result in a substantial jump in antibodies, giving us, in fact, the best response that we've seen with any combination of vaccines that have been used in India. Now, these kinds of studies are very important for policy. Unfortunately, they are not very widely done in India. And because sometimes vaccination has a political element in our country, it's very hard to get these kinds of data accepted by the policy makers, which is strange, but also a reflection of where we are today. I will stop there and hand back to you. Um, thank you for, uh, thank you, Professor, for your uh, count on your work with the vaccines. Um, as you said, many questions are still open and uh, it's a very interesting uh, issue how the policy making follows the science. And uh, we'll come back to that uh, later. Uh, so uh, now I will uh, introduce um, Professor Menon. 
So Professor Menon is a professor of physics and biology at Ashoka University, Sonepat in India, and then director of its Center of, for Climate Change and Sustainability. He's also a professor on Lien at the Theoretical Physics and Computational Biology Groups of the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai, where he was the founding dean of the Computational Biology Group. He is currently an adjunct professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. He has been awarded the DST Swarnajayandi Fellowship, was named an outstanding research investigator of the DAE SRC, an outstanding referee of the American Physical Society, and he's a Shastri Fellow of the Shastri Indo Canadian Institute and an elected Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences in India. Apart from his, from his scientific work, he's interested in making science accessible to the public. And we had the pleasure yesterday to listen to a fantastic talk by him on modeling uh, COVID-19. And a political named him, uh, named him recently in its worldwide list of 100 most influential academics in government. So Professor Menon, uh, over to you. Thank you, Katrina. And um, welcome and thanks to the, to the IOP and the IPA for this invitation. As you said, I'm a biophysicist. I work in these, across these two departments at Ashoka University, but I've had an abiding interest in disease models. And the way I approach it is a more quantitative approach that is guided by my own background in looking at different types of modeling approaches to a variety of problems, not just in disease. Apart from that, I've been interested in public health policy, and in particular, what models can do to help define better policy. So my own move towards thinking about these questions came a couple of years ago. In fact, it came before the COVID-19 pandemic. And the idea was to try and see how to build up a modeling community in India that would look at questions around public health that could actually make a difference to the way we thought about public health and how we approach public health in India. And about six months or eight months after I had moved to my new institution, COVID-19, of course, broke out. And much of my time since then has really been devoted to thinking about different types of model approaches and the relationship of modeling information and input to policy. I've also been writing extensively for the public about scientific questions that concern COVID-19. And at the back of my mind has been the question of how do you build up a modeling community in India? In my talk yesterday, I spoke about a bunch of models, a very different types of models that we had worked on, that many people across India had, in fact, been working on across India and across the world. These include standard compartmental models for disease. They include network models that describe a little of the complexity of how people interact with each other across ages, across situations, across locations. And then as well, in addition to that, the most granular and more detailed models that we know, which are agent-based models. And I described some effort of our own in a program called Bharat Sim that is directed towards devising an agent-based model for India with the complexity in it required to model anything from a small to a mid-sized city to even small communities of about 20 or 30,000 people so that we could address different types of questions, questions surrounding when is the right time to reopen schools, what is the right way to construct a vaccination program, what's the right combination of testing that you should do that would be optimal from the point of view, both of economics in terms of also in terms of outcomes. So all of these questions have a policy element, and that's where I think models are really useful in being able to devise just simple and better policy. One aim of this webinar is to try and see what happens or what should happen in the future, and how do the learning that we have now translate into a better understanding of what could be happening in the future, how to make a better future, given what we've already suffered through for the last two and a half years. So my view is that overall, worldwide, our models are getting better. I mean, COVID-19 presented an unprecedented challenge in terms of the need to get absolutely real-time information or projections for the next week, 10 days, two weeks, about a very fast-spreading disease that transmitted through a respiratory route and had very unusual peculiarities to it. A large fraction of people who were infected with it would, for example, be asymptomatic for the disease. We had imagined that a one-time early on, that a one-time infection with, with the SARS-CoV-2 might lead to lasting protection. Very soon we discovered that that was not true. We thought that COVID-19, that SARS-CoV-2 would, would um, evolve somewhat slowly. That turns out not to be true. We thought that the line of variants that started alpha, beta, gamma would proceed more or less in a logical succession, but just little changes on the previous variant. But then Omicron came up, which was very substantially different from the previous variants that we had seen. So continuously COVID-19 has surprised us. And even with all of that, models have been getting better and we have been able to accommodate in real time 
information that has come to us regarding the latest variants. Once we have some idea with increased transmissibility with respect to previous variants, the nature of the clinical manifestation, et cetera, to how many, what fraction of people when infected in a particular age group might go to hospital as well as be treated at home. So our own understanding is evolving, but in parallel with that, the whole COVID-19 situation, not just in India, but across the world, is also getting more complicated. Right now, the sorts of questions that you might want to answer or might expect to be able to answer is if someone was infected with the original derivative of the Wuhan variant right in the beginning in August or September of 2020, and then later with the, later had another infection with the Delta variant, what are the chances that they would have a mild infection with the Omicron variant when it came along in the early part of this year? To what extent does the combination of vaccination and a prior infection protect you? Or a vaccination and two prior infections with different variants protect you against what might come in the future? What indeed might come in the future? Do we understand enough about the landscape of different types of variants to be able to say this is a possibility, this would be worse than what we have now in terms of being more immune evasive, more transmissible, we are currently in no real position to answer that question, but admittedly, that is a very different and a very difficult question. What confronts us now? So I said models have improved our ability to study in real time the impacts of variants as information comes in, a somewhat closer connect between clinical information regarding disease and the variant, the consequences of a variant for in terms of in terms of symptoms has now improved from certainly from what it was in the early part of this. And we do have some good examples of where modeling has succeeded. Modeling overall was fairly good at, at estimating the, the what impact of the Omicron variant in India as well as outside, based on data that we had from South Africa regarding its impact. So that the peak in India, the extent of the peak, where it would peak first and then later, all of this pretty, was predicted fairly well in the model that we had at that time. So what should happen in the future and what is my, my hope for what might happen in the future? I'd hope to see a closer cooperation between those who model and those who produce data. For example, data of the type that, that Professor Khan spoke about. Another area that I would like to see is more granular models. We do have default models, compartmental models that have served us very well in the past. Those models are now approximately 100 years old by now. But we now know that there are many more important things that we need to include in these models. That the original formulators of those models, Kermack and McKendrick, we're not thinking about, which is how do you incorporate social determinants of health we know that the impact of a disease such as COVID-19 is very inhomogeneous across different sections of society. The poorer you are, the more marginalized you are, the more likely it is that you will sustain a COVID-19 infection with, with more severe consequences. The only thing that will save you is age. If you're younger, you tend to have much milder versions of the disease than if you're older. But then there are also larger questions. One question is certainly has to do with climate change. These are long-term questions of disease ecology. How can we anticipate, not just for COVID-19, but for dengue or malaria, how changes in temperature, hydrology, humidity, et cetera, that are an inevitable consequence of climate change? How will they affect the range across which we, across which we see currently dengue in India, different, different, uh, different um, uh, versions of, of, of other types of diseases such as chikungunya? These are all questions that are long-term questions that we have to attend to. So the questions of how to model appropriately disease ecology and then possible spillovers that we might see in the future, this is very important, especially given that three out of four emerging infectious diseases come are zoonotic in origin. What I'd like to see in the future is an improved relationship, certainly in India, of government to independent modelers. All public policy relating to health needs some idea of what might happen in the future. It's not clear at the moment where that information is actually feeding into government decision. What we need to understand in India is to have a more clear, more transparent way in which we understand what data is available, how that data is being used in models, and how those, what is the nature of the projections that are being supplied to government and on what basis they are being made. Only if model projections and model understanding is transparent, can we hope, can hope to be able to critique those models and to correct those models. And that I see as a large gap at the moment. Questions that Professor Khan referred to about data availability are certainly very important questions in data. And I hope we will move to a situation where data becomes more available for people to use and to look at. And we should not be worried about the political consequences of, for example, rising numbers of infection, because we consider that the positives of that in terms of an ability of independent modelers, independent people who look at data from multiple perspectives, it would be vastly improved if data was, more, was made more available. Altogether, I see a sort of strong and positive future for data modeling, for modeling of disease in India, not just for, for COVID-19, but for other types of infectious diseases, for other types of non-communicable diseases. I think this is now a sweet spot where people are aware 
of the importance of thinking about disease from multiple perspectives, of understanding the nature, the relationship between modeling and policy, understanding the nature of collecting the right sort of data that informs the models, collecting data and the improvement of data collection overall. For example, the, 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 the civil registration system that looks at deaths to understand mortality from a better point of view. All of these are important questions that I hope we will do a better job of in India, not just in India, but across the world in the future as we go along. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. You posed some very um, burning questions about uh, uh, use of models for understanding infectious diseases, how the policymaking can benefit from that. And you mentioned some challenges in India, and uh, I hope we're going to have time in the discussion to elaborate on uh, these challenges and think about the, what the future holds. Uh, so for uh, now, our uh, last but not least uh, uh, panelist, uh, Professor Catherine Noakes. Um, thank you, Professor, for being here with us. Um, um, uh, Catherine Knox is a Charter Mechanical Engineer with a background in Fluid Dynamics. Her teaching and research expertise is in built-in physics and environmental engineering. And she has led research into ventilation, indoor air quality, and infection control in the built environment. Professor Knox, internationally recognized group at the University of Leeds in the UK, conduct experimental and modeling-based studies to explore the transport of airborne pathogens, the influence of indoor air flows, and effectiveness of engineering approaches to controlling airborne disease transmission. This includes substantial research activity and policy advice relating to COVID-19 transmission. Professor Knox was director of the Pathogen Control Engineering Research Institute and director of research and innovation for the School of Civil Engineering at Leeds. She is currently the deputy director of Leeds Institute of Fluid Dynamic for Fluid Dynamics and co-director for the EPSRC Center for Doctoral Training in Fluid Dynamics. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Professor Knox co-chaired the Environment and Modeling Subgroup for the UK Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, also known as SAGE. Amongst many awards, Professor Knox was awarded OMB for services to the COVID-19 pandemic, and she was elected a Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. So Professor Knox, over to you. Thank you, Katerina. Um, I'm very nice to be here. Um, and I hope you can see my screen there. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes to, to talk about some of the, the many projects I've been involved in over the, the past two years and previously, um, and talk about the, the some of the science we've worked on and how that's fed into policy and some of the lessons we've learned there. Um, so as Katarina said, I've worked on um, air transmission of disease in the built environment um, for many years prior to the pandemic. Um, it was always seen as a bit of a niche topic and not much of interest until the pandemic came along and then suddenly there's a, a spark of interest worldwide around this area. So the main areas that I've been involved in over the past couple of years, um, a big chunk of that has been around coordinating and leading research. So those are studies that are looking at the, the underpinning fundamentals of transmission, that's from both the physics that we've heard a little bit about that already today, through to thinking about the biological aspects of it and the human behavioural side, and then what that means for the mitigation measures in there. Um, that's been through a huge number of projects, um, most of which have been national collaborations, but also I've worked quite closely with international partners, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, looking at the evidence for airborne transmission and, and putting the case to WHO for the fact that we need to take uh, we need to take airborne transmission seriously. And I've worked on projects looking at a whole range of different settings. So workplaces, which is quite general and covers just about anywhere, transport settings, care homes, schools, hospitals, and then some of the fundamentals around technologies. Um, aside, alongside that, I had a major role in policy advice during the pandemic. Um, so I co-founded and co-chaired the Environment and Modelling Group for um, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, which is known as SAGE. Um, so this was the, that, that group takes advice from many different uh, sources. Um, 
that this was the first time there'd been a group specifically looking at transmission in the environment. So that was a very rapidly convened group um, and basically responded to government um, questions over the uh, over an almost a two year period focusing on transmission and then also I've worked very closely with um, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Academy of Medical Sciences and various engineering professional bodies in the UK, the NHS and a number of government working groups looking more about how we turn some of the scientific knowledge into practice and I think one of the important things in here is thinking about the different types of evidence so I've just highlighted here some of these evidences. Um, the blue ones are the ones that we would get from data on transmission so we might get information from uh, outbreaks uh, investigations we might get information from population level from sort of test and trace type systems um, sometimes we get more in-depth data from sequencing of the virus in certain settings and then there are particular studies that can be carried out using that data or on top of that data such as case control or cohort studies and all of these tell us how the virus is spreading at a population level. Um, they tell us, they give us insights into some of the risk factors, the environments where people are catching it, but they don't tell us the mechanisms of transmission. So then the second set of studies, all the green boxes, are the studies which we can carry out to start to unpick this a little bit. So some of these will be, uh, we have had human challenge study in the UK. There are a number of animal studies to look at viral emissions. Um, there's um, studies in laboratories on the, on the behavior of the virus in air and on surfaces. We can produce mechanistic models um, and data from laboratory experiments um, as, as shown earlier by Professor Basso. And then, you know, building epidemic models as again also discussed earlier. Um, I think it's important to say no one of these things will tell us the answer. We have to put them all together and understand across them. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a whistle stop tour of some of the research we've been involved in. Um, a major piece of work that um, I'm still involved with is a study called the Protect Study. This is one of six national core studies that were set up in the UK. Um, and this one focuses on transmission and the complexity of this, looking at the virus, the environment and human behaviour. And it's really to start to take what we know from theory into real world settings and then how that informs policy practice and is designed to be responsive to the needs of government. So the study is directly funded by the government in the UK. Um, it's led by uh, Health and Safety Executive Chief Scientific Advisor, Professor Andrew Curran, and it's a massive project. There are about 200 researchers involved in it. Um, there are about 20 institutions involved in it, and we have 37 projects at the last count within it. So it's broken into several themes, looking at different elements around transmission and understanding transmission. So I lead theme two, which focuses on all things modelling, um, within the sort of uh, the more of a mechanistic modeling rather than population scale modeling though and um, that within it we've got 12 different organizations and 15 projects that we run within that that particular theme and just to give some some insights into some of the projects so something we carried out in relatively early on was the, the you know, there's been a huge debate about the roots of transmission and what the potential what the, the proportion of transmission happens through surfaces through larger droplets and through smaller inhaled aerosols and it's very difficult to be a, to be certain about this even now I think there are big uncertainties in this although I think we know that the majority is through some form of inhalation but we went through an expert elicitation process. We asked people all around the world about the detail of transmission according to the pathways shown on the diagram and, and their understanding of this, the evidence behind this. And we use this to produce something that was really quite public facing. Um, this uh, it doesn't work on this screen now, but it is actually an interactive model where you can click on different things and you can uh, explore the 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 different, say, respiratory activities or what happens if you're wearing a face covering or what happens if you clean your hands and looking at the relative proportion of um, re relative exposure for an uninfected person. Um, a second area we've done a lot of work around is on actually modelling 
what people emit. Um, so we've done this through computational fluid dynamics models uh, of a simplified person in a small room, but we actually built the model using some real world data from biological experiments with a person who was carrying out respiratory activities. So we used um, tra particle tracking models. We built in the evaporation in there. We've since built in um, putting um, viral RNA copies into the, the, um, the, the emission rate. And we, we, we modeled both the sort of carrier flow, so the exhaled breath, and then a particular particle size distribution model um, for a range of different um, activities that people do to then look at then deposition onto surfaces and measurement in the air. And just to give you know, some very visual um, out outputs from this, this is just showing uh, the simplified person in a, in a, a very small ventilated room um, a, a, um, the initial one on the left, you can see that they've just emitted the, this sort of packet of, of um, aerosols and droplets. The larger ones are coloured red and they will drop out onto the surface, whereas the smaller, smallest ones are, are coloured blue. And we can see the small ones here and the large ones here. But over time, over not very long time, only 24 seconds, we can see that evaporation means that some of those larger ones are still in the air. And of course, the smaller blue ones are starting to disperse throughout a room. And of course, if you go right to the right hand side, after five minutes, it's the, the, those smaller particles are distributed throughout the whole room. So we can use these models to explore um, a range of different factors. And we're, we've just finished a piece of work looking at temperature and humidity effects and, and how this changes exposure to, uh, diff to, to um, viral RNA at diff different distances. Um, another area we've worked on both within the PROTECT project and in a, 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 a different project, something called TRAC, which focused on public transport, is something called quantitative microbial risk assessment. So this is where we try and understand the exposure to virus and what that might mean for infection rates. Um, and this, in this case, it is a stochastic agent-based model, and it, it, it models not just the airborne transmission models, the close range transmission of the, the larger um, droplets as well as the aerosols, and it models fomite transmission. So it looks at contaminated hands and touching of surfaces and how that, that, that influences it. Um, we built the model for a, initially for a subway line. We've since built a model for a, a, a bus as well. Um, and we, we go through that process of looking at the respiratory activity with a particular viral load um, and then model a series of act activities that people do within these carriages, um, the, the, the loading, their locations, um, and run a stochastic model to get distributions um, for these parameters. And we can use this to explore the potential for uh, looking at different uh, uh, routes of exposure. So on the left, um, we can separate out the exposure by the airborne close range and fomite routes. And um, what is interesting is that the potentially you could have some quite high fomite doses, but they tend to be rare outliers. Um, and this is because potentially you can, you know, if you've coughed on your hand or blown your nose, you could have a, quite a significant amount of virus on, on a hand, which can, and we, within a public transport setting, people do touch quite a lot of surfaces. With the airborne one, the, the exposure is probably lower, but the mean and the median are closer together, which means that if you've got a, a, a somebody who's highly infectious, um, if they are capable of causing an airborne infection, everybody in that carriage can get a dose from it, uh, as opposed to just a small number of people who are close by. And then on the right, we looked at some of the different parameters that affect it. So we looked at population level prevalence, which makes a huge difference in the amount of virus people are exposed to. We looked at the loading of transport vehicles, which again makes quite a big significant difference. Um, and then we looked at mask wearing and mask wearing is quite interesting in that it, it significantly reduces both the median and the mean. So it reduces some of those high outliers um, and it reduces all of the transmission routes. Uh, the last study I want to mention, which is ongoing at the moment, which is quite a different type of study, is an intervention study where we are actually looking at air cleaning devices, 
we put these air cleaning devices into classrooms in Bradford in the north of the UK. Um, and we've got 30 primary schools, 10 are a control group where we just measure their air quality parameters. We have 10 which have uh, HEPA filters in them. Um, and so we measure, we, we're looking at the influence of those. And then we have 10 schools which have some form of UV device in them. And we measure all the air quality parameters. And then we also measure infection rates and absence in there. Um, Though the data, we, we're in the process of analysing that data. We don't have the results yet, but we're hoping to have those very soon. But we have found quite a lot of real practical aspects around implementing and using air cleaners. You know, simple things like you need to consider the noise, you need to consider the size of them, that not all classrooms have sufficient um, electrical plug sockets to implement them immediately you have to think about the maintenance you have to train people to use them so there's a lot of interesting uh, practicalities have come out of that too so just want to finish up by just talking a little bit about the the taking these models a lot of the work we do is is quite theoretical it allows us to quantify a lot of things it allows us to understand where we've got relative importance of things and the gaps but we have to remember a lot of it's idealized. And if you look at the diagram on the right, you can see there's a whole whole bunch of other factors in there, particularly the socioeconomic factors, the behavioral factors, which are very difficult to incorporate within models and very difficult to incorporate them correctly within models. And this starts to then also go into communication. So I've had quite a lot of experience during the pandemic of trying to communicate science, both in terms of the public and the and policymakers. Um, and I think that has changed over the course of the pandemic, but you know, in the early days, policymakers were desperately looking for an easy solution. They wanted a simple message. They wanted, is there a magic bullet solution? And there isn't one. Um, and particularly when it comes to things like ventilation, it is complex. You know, it is a, it's a, telling people to wash your hands and wash your hands for 20 seconds is quite a simple message. Explaining ventilation to people is a lot more complex. Um, and we can use models, but again, they are very complex. There's an awful lot of physics models, fluid dynamics models that have come out during the pandemic, but have not really made it to the policymakers because we haven't been able to translate them as well. So um, a lot of my role has been to wade through huge numbers of papers and to try and translate some of this data extract what's what's new what's important versus what's just adding to the, the evidence base and the cross-disciplinarity of that is incredibly important um also work very closely with the um royal academy of engineering they've led a piece of work over the past two years looking at infection resilient environments including the graph that you can see which is looking at cost benefit analysis of improving ventilation and showing that actually it's beneficial particularly in commercial and local community buildings which includes schools and hospitals um, but again that's thinking about the, the the real world how do we move forward strategy from where we are now to how we improve environments in the long term so I think my key takeaways from this is we've learned an awful lot. We learned an awful lot over the past 20 to 30 years, and we've learned even more in the past two years. Um, there's a lot of gaps in there. Um, even though we've, we, we can model better than we thought we ever did, there's still a lot of gaps and a lot of uncertainties. And there are still threats in there. So COVID hasn't gone away, and we always have that threat of a future pandemic. Um, we know that to be resilient to the future we have to tackle some things in the built environment it won't solve everything it's complex it's time consuming and we won't solve it overnight and even then it won't tackle all transmission but it's important that we do that and we need to do that collaboratively um, i think i one of the big things i learned was that as a scientist or an engineer we can inform policy but we are not the policy makers um, and it's quite important that distinction that the policy makers make those decisions they have to take a whole raft of other things into account and we as scientists and engineers inform that policy and we can make a big difference but we have to engage correctly to do that and engage with each other and i think there's been a, a lot of challenge with how we engage with the media and, and how in social media has has played out during the pandemic so i will stop at that point and um, just say an acknowledgement to a lot of people that I've worked with 
over the course of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Knox. This was a very um, informative overview of all the work you have done uh, for the UK during the pandemic and you are continuing to do. Uh, so um, all of uh, the speakers have talked about um, science and policy. So I would like to uh, pose a question to all of you and then we see who responds first. Um, there are these challenges, like as um, uh, Kath just mentioned, we can inform policy, but we don't make policy. So how um, are there any ways to overcome uh, this um, and, and create a better um, interface between scientists and policymakers? Maybe Kath, we start from you since you are the one that outlined this uh, issue. Yeah, so the, I think the interface with science and policymakers, I, I mean, it starts by having good processes that allow that dialogue. Um, I think within the UK, that has worked quite well on the whole. Um, and it, it happens because we have um, each government department has chief scientific advisors and those chief scientific advisors provide a, a route to conversations with the scientific community and provide a, an interface into government. But I think, you know, there were areas, so for example, um, population scale modeling um, was at the beginning of the pandemic that where they were able to scale up very quickly because there was a st established groups already who, who were working on that, where, who were set up, but previous, you know, they were set up in the HIV um, pandemic in the, the 1980s and then already there ready to respond whereas for example the area I work in around environment there was no national group set up there so we were starting from the beginning on that one and I think that's a lesson about putting things in place so you have people who are ready to respond quickly. Okay. That's one lesson that we uh, we can record uh, for today as we go forward. And um, what about uh, the other panelists? And what do they think about the interface of science and policy? And in particular about your experience in India, where I would assume things uh, work differently to the UK in this aspect. So Katrina, maybe I can speak uh, about to some extent about that. So I sit on a lot of committees in India that relate to vaccination policy. I sit on a lot of committees at WHO that relate to vaccination recommendations to governments. And um, it's been in many ways a frustrating experience because while scientists recognize that their role, or serious scientists recognize that their role is to advise, to provide interpretations of data, to tell the government that these are your options, uh, what frequently happens is that decisions are made without taking the science into account. It's more about uh, framing about how the government wants to project itself. So it's been an incredibly frustrating experience. I also had the privilege of being on the International Advisory Committee for the UK's National COVID-19 Studies. And it was just phenomenal to see how much the range, you know, what Kath spoke about, the range and the depth of studies across infection control, looking at immunology, looking at vaccines, looking at surveillance was just incredible. I think the UK's studies were a model for the world. And uh, we did a lot of things well, despite having the right kind of interactions between scientists and policymakers. I think Gautam and Saptarishi might also have some things to say about that. I can go first and then Saptarishi can uh, go after that. 
Yeah, you go first. Um, no, I, I think I agree with all of what uh, Gagandeep said. I think one question is also there has to be some level of trust of government in sharing data with external sources. I mean, there's this tendency to look inwards, which is not there in the UK. I think the UK has done a very successful job of integrating government departments with external advice from universities, from private modelers, from other types of, of people who look just look at data. That level of trust isn't there. As Gagandi pointed out, there is some of these decisions are made on a political basis rather than really strictly arguing from, from scientific input. I agree completely that scientists shouldn't be the people taking the decisions. Finally, these are political decisions. But the question is, what is the nature of the politics that enters there? I mean, there is finally a trade-off. It should, shouldn't be a case where the only guide to policy is really the political fallout that you might expect. And there should be some space in between where you combine what is possible, what has to be sold to the public, in a sense. And the politicians are the people with the responsibility of doing that with what is sensible policy overall in terms of disease control. So we are, we are sort of far behind the UK in that. It's a pleasure to read the PhD reports. It's a pleasure to sort of you know, understand how all of the structure is built, the one that the cap spoke about, of, of the, the way all of these different chunks fit together into this very much the larger, broader picture. I don't think we're there yet, but it is a very good model for us, I think. Can I just add another comment? So, I mean, yeah, thank you to both of you for the, the comments that you said about the UK. Um, I think we are far from perfect, though, and, and there is an interesting difference between policymakers and politicians. So I think we I think we have ways to get science into policymakers and civil servants. But then, obviously, I think everybody's seen that politicians around the world have not always followed that science. Um, now, there are sometimes good reasons because they do have a difficult balancing act, but there are also places where it has been straightforward political. You know, we know that wearing a face mask can help, and yet we have politicians who, who on the one hand say to people wear a face mask and then they don't do it themselves. So I, and I think that, I think that, is, I mean, in some countries have been better than other there, but I think that's happened the world over. Um, Sabtashi, do you have a comment about the interface? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to have a small comment that India is perhaps the only country in which there are actually four national academies, three of science and one of engineering. And I think no other country in the world has got four academies for science and engineering. And so you would expect Dr. that- Dr. Rishi, don't forget medicine has a separate <laughs> academy. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so five, so let's make it five. And so, and I think there is an agricultural academy also. So I, I'm, I'm, there are countless academies. So there is supposed to be, you would expect a lot of interface between the government and the scientists, but we have not seen any of this, not just for the COVID related work, but in general about any kind of uh, such problems. There seems to be a disconnect between the, how the government operates and what are the actual scientific findings that makes the government to take, to take those decisions. So it has been rather fortunate to a certain extent that how India survived, maybe the first wave and the second wave and uh, the Omicron wave so if we somehow survived, uh, I mean, Professor Kang would be able to give more <laughs> realistic answers than how we survived it. But it is definitely not based on the transmission models or the, you know, the face mask studies or any other things. So it was, uh, it was more fortunate than anything else that I can think of. So I think I agree with Professor Menon and everybody else that what we lack is a multi-pronged approach in which you converge on the problem from multiple directions and each of us brings a small piece of the puzzle or solves a small piece of the puzzle so that everything kind of snap fits into a larger scheme of things. So that would have been ideal, but it, had not, it has not happened. It has been mainly individualistic efforts, so to say in India. I mean, I may be doing some modeling, Gautam there may be doing some modeling and then there may be mass studies, this study, everywhere. People have been doing uh, their own work, but it has not been a, a proper unified attempt, so to say. 
towards this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. So what do you think uh, would be the way forward now that uh, other countries have used um, science more? Um, is there a hope in, in the India that uh, there will be a, a more structured way to um, uh, have science inform policy? It has to be, otherwise, I mean, I mean, you, we may not be lucky all the time. Okay, there were some signs, obviously, not that all the things, all the actions that were taken that kind of knee jerk, but uh, there has to be some kind of a concerted effort. Maybe as Gautam suggested, have a data repository in which all the data are made public. You know, all the trial data, the 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 zero data, and all the data should be made public so that people have a good idea uh, that what we are actually dealing with. Then only people can not play blind, and because it's a complicated pathway. As Professor Knox mentioned, it's a complicated pathway of how the disease travels. And it's essentially a multi-scale problem as well. It involves biology, it involves transmission, it involves fluid dynamics. Each and everything is a problem of its own. So unless you have a guy, a fluid mechanics guy, combining with a biologist, with an immunologist and other people, you cannot have a solution to this particular problem. It's almost impossible. So you need that concerted effort, definitely. So uh, this makes me very nicely to another theme that I think will be very good to explore, which is how us scientists talk to each other when we are from different disciplines. So here we have um, a modeler, uh, and Gaudam is a physicist, uh, uh, you and uh, Basu and uh, Catherine are, uh, Kath are um, mechanical engineers, and we also have a virologist here. And so in, 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 in government advisory groups, uh, this was a kind of a usual thing to have actually. And I found that very interesting myself. But do you think it was something like, um, can it be sustained? Because it used to be like uh, in many countries, India and the UK, there are silos around each discipline and we chose talk to our own uh, rather than uh, talk to other disciplines. So how do you see the future of these interdisciplinary collaborations as we move away from this pandemic, other things and challenges uh, like the monkeypox is now out? What, what do we do? How do we ensure that interdisciplinarity is preserved, so to speak? I can comment. So I, I... I think it's really important that we do learn from this because I think it's the interdisciplinarity that has has got us this far and you know it hasn't we haven't solved everything but we need more of that interdisciplinary science. Um, I think there are two parts there one is about um, scientists in and engineers in universities collaborating with people in um, government science institutes so and, and I think we've learned a lot more about doing that well um, during COVID. The other thing is I think this is something that funding agencies need to respond to because so often it is the funding agency that that sets those artificial boundaries around something and you know I, I suspect we've all had grants which we've applied for which fall down a crack because you know the the novelty of the project is in bringing two disciplines together yet the individual discipline work is not seen as novel enough or that it just doesn't fit with what the funder requires because the funder says it must be medical and they don't want the social sciences or the engineering in it or the funder says it must all be social sciences so yeah, I, I think that, that that's something which we need um, we, we need funders to respond to. I do also think there is, it takes time, and we shouldn't forget that, that, you know, it takes time to learn each other's language and learn what each other can contribute and, to, you know, to not just assume things. You know, there's, there was an, a lot of people who suddenly became experts during the pandemic, and a lot of those people, you know they they really wanted to help but they hadn't read the literature and you know we're making the same mistakes I made 20 years ago in some of those models and things and I think you know we need we need to we need to develop a new generation we need our next generation of PhD students 
to be working in a way interdisciplinary ways and to learn some of the complexities of this. If I can come in there, I agree completely that, that um, as someone who works in biophysics, I know the importance of you know, collaborating with people. You don't have to know everything, but you do need a collaborator who knows exactly the parts that you don't know. And that's that space in between that really makes for good science. I think COVID-19 has taught us a lot about such collaborations and in a way that really nothing in the past did. It's just the fact that this was a global emergency and things had to be had to happen in real time in terms of collaboration. People had to come together. And I think that's a lesson that will stay with us for a bit. I think it's situation is in, in sciences, less in science engineering interface, but much less in the science humanities interface. And if you look at the social determinants of disease, that's an interdisciplinary area where practically no one really works or no, no there is no practically no group in India that really looks at that question in a quantitative sense. And I think that's the next frontier for thinking about it to disciplinary work, especially in regards to disease. In, in essence, I think we need a Manhattan project for essentially like an equivalent of a Manhattan project for disease modeling and yeah. stuff. So, because some of the knowledges are pre-existing. For example, the area that I work, I know a lot about droplets and you know how these droplets transmit, aerosolize and all these things. We just have to put it in the correct context and then you have to interface with a person from another discipline who can, who can tell you that once it gets into your mouth, through your nose and other parts, how does it actually uh, proliferate or something like that. So those, those connections were never made before the COVID-19, not in a large scale fashion. I'm pretty sure it was made, but not in this large scale fashion. So yeah, you need a Manhattan project, essentially. Equivalent of a Manhattan project. Uh, Gagadip, would you like to add something about the interdisciplinarity challenge? Well, you know, I started working with Gautam before the pandemic, but at least it gave us some exposure to how different fields work. And it was useful, I think, for us and for the groups to understand how data are collected. The two examples that I gave of the studies that we are doing were really about the fact that in India, primary data collection is required to inform everything that everybody does, and yet hardly anybody does those primary studies. So how do people like me stop collecting primary data and or have more people do it and learn how to use it better? I can't do it on my own. I need collaborators to be able to work with them. And because my interests are in infectious diseases and in communities, I really need all the help from different disciplines that I can get. I think what Saptarishi said about the Manhattan Project, in India they're called mission mode programs. Yeah. Um, I think one of the issues in India that is kind of overweening is the distrust between public and private. And uh, if you belong to a university or an academic setup versus being part of a government institution, the interactions that you can freely have vary very much by where you come from. And similarly, the amount of support that you can get also depends on the type of institution you're from. So couldn't agree more that it's required, but it's complicated and a long path. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for these very valuable uh, thoughts on uh, interdisciplinarity. We have three questions in the question and answer box. So one of them is actually related to interdisciplinarity is from uh, Mr. Chris Bundy. So I'm gonna read that first. A great question about how to sustain interdisciplinarity. How can other scientists reach out to behavioral scientists as the physics, math, et cetera, is only effective if used by people? So maybe this is a question for uh, Gaudam, who has been working with social scientists uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the the prime motivator for scientists is, of course, money in terms of being able to sustain the research. So if you have if you have a pot of money that says that, look, we'd like to encourage research that looks at the social determinants of disease, and we will support that. And this requires that someone who do an epidemiologist, a modeler, et cetera, talks and interacts with people who work on the on the on the side of gathering data, on the side of social of the social sciences. So, and this country is a complicated country. It has it's divided by caste, by religion. There's a whole lot of complexities in economics there. And this is why these questions are very nuanced and difficult to answer. And that's precisely why we should study them, why they are interesting. And they are very relevant to the understanding of, how, of diseases in communities, diseases across populations. So as I said, government and policymakers need to say that, look, this is important to study. This is the next frontier in terms of our understanding of how disease spreads within groups and communities and populations. And we will support this. I think that's almost guaranteed to get the, get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. I think there's some very practical things that either funders or governments or universities can do to support this. So it isn't always easy to get to know people in other disciplines. And a, an awful lot of successful collaborations happen by accident that you just happen to meet that person and have a conversation. But I think there are some ways in which you can enable it. So there are workshop type events where, you know, focus around, you know, particular social determinants of disease, where you deliberately invite people from different disciplines and encourage people to attend and provide ways in which people can network at those meetings and discuss ideas informally. And I think, you know, even just sort of funding for networks can really help this. I mean, I think the the most, and I think the you know the the use of online um, things like Zoom has massively helped that. You know, I, we've I, I've learned huge amounts from being in meetings with people who are outside of my discipline, and I think that would have never happened without, I suppose, the crisis of the pandemic and the fact that we had that ability to so easily be in those meetings. If there are no other uh, comments, I will go to the other question, other two questions. Um, something that is uh, madly related is a question to Professor Basu. How do you think COVID-19 affected the Indian economies from an anonymous attendee? No, uh, well, the name is below, Surika. Oh, wow. I mean... <laughs> do you know the answer to that? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, my, I'm not an economist, <laughs> but obviously it had uh, quite a bit of a devastating effect, as we all know, especially, I guess, uh, to the small scale sector, uh, small scale businesses, the small scale industries, and you could say many of them folding. In fact, around the Indian Institute of Science area, if you just take a walk, you will see that most of the vendors who used to have this, you know, small shops and stalls, they're all gone. I mean, they were all gone and, and we don't know where they went and what happened to them, but definitely they did not come back after the pandemic kind of subsided. So yeah, it had a devastating effect definitely on the economy, but, the, but what exactly is the mechanism by which it affected? I think an economist will be able to provide a more lucid answer to that. I can see from a common man point of view that a lot of businesses folded a lot of people lost their jobs. Uh, some people like us, we preserved our jobs. So <laughs> that was a good part. But apart from that, uh, most of I could see many people, including my own friends, my own, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the circles that I know people, I've seen many of them actually lose jobs. And so it, yeah, it had, it affected all strata of the society probably. Thank you. There is another question for you, which is a more technical one. It's about the speed of droplets uh, and the mask. Um, have you, you are able to see the question and answer um, box, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that right in front. Yeah, what, what I think the question is that whether the droplet after passing through the mask, whether the velocity comes down or not, it does. For example, from 10 meter per second, 
as it comes up from your mouth, it goes to about two to three meters per second after it comes out of the mask. So, but the uh, moment it becomes an aerosol, even two meters per second is sufficient. It would never settle or it would not settle for a very perceivable amount of time. So yeah, the perimeter of the damage may be still a little limited, but since it is an aerosol, it can remain in the atmosphere for an extended period of time. Honestly speaking, just the velocity at which it comes out may not matter that much. Thank you. Um, so we have a few more minutes, um, and I think I have two questions. One is for Gagandeep on uh, vaccine equity, and then I would also like to ask uh, Kath about how we go forward with ventilation and communicating to the public effectively on, because you said there were some gaps there in how the public understands the question for ventilation. Uh, so, Gagandeep, um, you have probably uh, encountered many times discussions about how to uh, better deploy vaccines around the world uh, through your work in the international committees. Do you have some thoughts to share with us on that? Well, I think, um, you know, equity was front and center during the early stage of vaccine availability. And I think the the answer to equity is an oversupply of vaccines. Lots of vaccines available to everybody, leaving people to choose whether they should get vaccines or not. However, when there is a shortage, you know where vaccines go. They tend to go to the most well-resourced countries and populations. And that's true both internationally as well as within countries. So I'll give you the example of India. In the early days of the pandemic, we started to have a vaccination program from January 16th, 2021. And we had an electronic registry where you could ask for an appointment to get vaccinated. There were a certain number of doses. Once vaccination was opened up beyond healthcare workers and the elderly, there were a certain number of doses allocated based on the population of an urban or a rural area. Now, rather obviously, people in rural areas do not have access to an electronic database that is created in English in many parts of India. So what wound up happening was that rich people would use the registrations in rural areas and go and get themselves vaccinated when poor people living in those areas actually didn't even know that vaccine was available to them. So when there is shortage, the rich find a way, the poor get left behind, and equity requires really that everyone should have equal opportunity to get an intervention that will potentially do them good. The only way that can happen is by intention, that we make sure that the poorest, least resourced are most protected. There are many ways of doing this internationally, many discussions right now about placing vaccine manufacturing in countries that have traditionally not made vaccines but also in setting up systems where vaccines can be distributed to remote areas as easily as they are now found in cities. It's complicated, there's a lot to do, but at least we are recognizing what needs to be done. Thank you. I hope this can be resolved in some way as we move towards the, the future. Um, there is another question that actually uh, goes together with what I would like to ask uh, Kath. How do you think the science should be communicated to the public and do you think it could be improved? Uh, can we um, focus this in relation to how the public understands at the moment um, ventilation, and you've done so much work on poorly ventilated environments and how they, uh, we can improve them. What do you think are the gaps now and how can we uh, more effectively um, com uh, communicate to the public about this issue? Yeah, and I think 
<laughs> I think that that is a, a difficult one. Um, you know, if you look at the early, I think a lot of people, a lot of the public listened to government messages very early on in the pandemic, but then stopped listening. So the, the messages, for example, around ventilation, which came later, were missed by an awful lot of people who had not, you know, had probably lost interest by that point. Um, and I think it also can be difficult to get across complex messages um, in ways that people can understand. So, I mean, I think there are some things in here, I think that we, we can do better in schools, um, you know, starting with, you know, embedding some of the knowledge about disease transmission and things um, and healthy environments in schools better will help you, you know, bring up a generation who understand more. Um, I think there is also a, a government and regulatory response as well needed though, because there is a huge amount of misinformation out there. Um, and that misinformation was not effectively tackled and therefore people have received information that has been damaging in many places, particularly around vaccines, um, uh, therapeutic drugs, face masks, um, where people have have actively um, sort of damaged the response that should have happened. Um, I also think that there is a need for governments to learn about communicating better with communities because there are there are some people who will listen directly to. Communications. I think in many places, though, you need community leaders, trusted advocacy groups, charities, others who who work on the ground with harder to reach groups who can help dispel some of that misinformation, help de help deal with fears that people have and really make that that difference. So we need lots of different routes to communicate. Maybe I can come in on that one as well. It's it's a complex landscape, and, and I think certain people also acknowledge that. I think part of it is just tamping down sort of things that happen in the news cycle. Someone says, you know, in the next few weeks we expect about half a million cases. What do you have to say about that? And so much of effort is really tamping down disinformation of that sort, telling people that we that's not what we expect. What we can reasonably say is the following. And so communication and the nature of communication is important that you do need to have people who are trusted intermediaries. Often communication that comes directly from government is not necessarily trusted because it's believed to follow a government line. And so the question is, are there people in between who can present their views on this in a way that is not alarmist, that is realistic, that follows the science, but allows for nuance, allows for the fact that there are uncertainties. And it's communicating uncertainty that often is the most difficult part of all of this. I was part of a group of scientists called the Indian Scientist Response to COVID-19, where we did a lot of work on basically misinformation, combating misinformation. India has a large number of languages, so we did 18 of those languages. We prepared little, little snippets of, of, of information that attacked particular pieces of misinformation. But it's also important to recognize that people get information in many different and complex ways. A lot of it is WhatsApp messages. And uh, there are WhatsApp groups that are constituted in families and apartment blocks, et cetera. And so how do you construct messages that can be put onto those groups and can be circulated that combat the types of fairly vicious sometimes misinformation that propagates along that? So I think we have a lot to learn about how to do this well, but certainly we're now much more aware of the complexities that are involved and what we need to do in the future regarding this. Are there any comments in relation to science communication in India? In relation to the pandemic? I think Gautam said it all. Okay. So we are reaching um, at the end of our session. Thank you all so much for your very valuable contributions and thoughts. Um, so the topic of the discussion is COVID-19 lessons for the future. So um, I think we heard um, some very important lessons today. One is about preserving interdisciplinarity, um, which was um, 
a very prominent theme during the pandemic, so we should keep that and uh, also include social scientists. The other thing I noted down is um, we should have structures in place uh, ready for the next crisis. So this happened in the UK with HIV modeling, but then as Kath said, um, other um, the environmental uh, science um, group that she co-founded had to be uh, um, put together very quickly. So for the next uh, crisis, uh, we need similar structures in other countries as well. Um, and then the other, the last um, lesson I have down is um, how do you better, um, we need to have ways to better communicate science to the public. Uh, and uh, create consistent messaging. And that again comes back to how the science informs the media in this case. And um, so do you have any last thoughts to add to a series of lessons we can take out of our discussion today? I think you summarized it very well, Katrin. Yeah, I agree. I think what you said was great. Okay. Um, so in that uh, respect, then uh, we can draw uh, the discussion to a close. Thank you again all so much for being here. And maybe Professor Madurima wants to say something at the end. That was an absolutely fascinating panel discussion. And now there's so much to learn from all of you. And uh, I think uh, for me personally, the take home message has been the need for multidisciplinary approach in doing science. And this is something that we should all really take home. Uh, so as the convener of this two day event, uh, it's my duty and my pleasure to formally propose a vote of thanks. At the outset, our thanks are due to the Indian Physics Association and the Institute of Physics and to our two speakers of this event yesterday, Catherine McCauley and Dr. Me. Today's panel discussion, like I said, was not just educative, but informative. Um, our thanks are due to the panelists, including the two speakers, Katrina, for chairing this session, Dr. Mahoney, who emphasized on the need for interaction between modelers and data producers. Um, Catherine Notes, who spoke of the need to build an evidence-based model, uh, Sapir Shivasu for uh, that elaborate study on the use of masks. Gugandeep Khan for uh, telling us about the correlation with the history of infection and vaccinations with the disease. It was absolutely fascinating. A note of thanks was due to uh, Dr. Samrat Mandal, Sati Narayana, Vandana Nanu, and Lajanya Rodrigo Kadnapa in organizing this event. They have been the ones working in the back of it, and to the Department of Atomic Energy and the Tata Trust for supporting this event. Finally, a big thank you to all our participants of both the days on both Zoom and on uh, the YouTube. With this, uh, we for conclude this two-day uh, IPA IOP Foster of Science webinar. So I thank you and wish you a good day. Thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank Bye. you all. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.